proceeds in because on the front edge of the glacier, it's going to be a climate that's unsuitable for most of the, the forests that would have been here. So they all have to move south. So they end up in Kentucky, in the mountains of eastern Kentucky, into uh, mountains in Tennessee as these refuges from the climate. And so they move south. Luckily, glaciers, glaciers don't move very quickly. So the plants can seed, drop seeds away, reestablish, drop seeds away, reestablish, drop seeds away. And so there's movement happening of the plants escaping the glaciers. So the glaciers would have to move really slow if trees could outrun them. Right, they move very slow. Glacier, glaciers don't move at a pace that's uh, uh, visible. So again, we've got mountain, mountains in Kentucky and Tennessee that become the refuges. And now if you go to Smoky Mountains, what do you find in the, you go up into, you go to Newfound Gap. Who's been to Newfound Gap or Clingman's Dome in Smoky Mountains? What do you find there? What are the forests like at Newfound Gap and you go higher on to Clingman's Dome? What do they look like? At Clingman's Dome, yeah, they're spruce. So it's spruce and pines. Newfound Gap, it's like, northern Michigan. It's going to be um, uh, maple beach hardwood forests. We'll have some uh, um, uh, eastern hemlock. So forests that we see in northern Michigan, we see at elevation at Clingman's Dome and, or at Newfound Gap and Clingman's Dome and Smokies. Because those plants got there as things moved south, basically they escaped to the mountains. They stayed there as everything moved back. So we have multiple glacial periods. We have the, the southernmost boundary of glaciation, but then we have the Wisconsin glacier that was the most recent glaciation that existed. And you can see that north of this boundary, we've got um, till plains, which are basically where glaciers just kind of bulldozed everything. We have moraines, which are where the glacier sat and just dropped stuff. And we get these kind of ridges and, and uh, rock deposits and sand deposits. Um, we get multiple different features on the physiography, the land shape, because of the glaciation. South of that, we've got uphill or upland and, and plateaus that formed because they didn't get glaciated. They didn't have this bulldozer coming across them. So glaciers move south. The plants had to move south. Glaciers moved north, the plants came back. So our forests are from Kentucky and Tennessee. That's where our forests came from. So the question of where did they come from, they came from Kentucky and Tennessee. As the glaciers receded, that's where our trees came from. That's where our plants came from. And so if we look at some other features that are here, and we'll come back to, to this. Uh, actually, we'll come to it in just a second. We have Fort Wayne right here, right? We're on the edge of what was Maumee, the, the ancient Lake Maumee uh, Lake Plain, which became the Black Swamp, but only after Lake Maumee dra uh, drained. So we basically have Fort Wayne right here at this confluence of, of several different features. We have a plain. We have another plain here that formed because the lake formed there. And then we have this moraine, this moranal complex, which are basically ridges that formed from the deposits of rock and sand um, as the glaciers started pulling back. So we get some really interesting things happening here as, as the glaciers recede. So about 18,000 years ago, we've got the retreat of the Wisconsin glacier. So it starts pulling north and basically moves off of Indiana, um, depositing those moraines in the northern part of the state as it, as it retreats. 14 to 16,000 years ago, we have basically Arctic tundra in Indiana. Because as the glacier's receding, the climate's not just immediately temperate. It has to basically uh, follow the glacier back. And so we're looking at Arctic tundra that then becomes a spruce fir forest. So we would have had spruce fir forests here at some point about 14,000 years ago. And then we have a big event happen. We have the Maumee Torrent. So basically there was a, a dam that sat at 
the edge of ancient Lake Maumee right here in Fort Wayne. And about 14,000 years ago, that ruptured. And um, it's not really clear if it took um, a matter of days or if it took thousands of years for that water to drain, but it tore through what is now um, Highway 24. If you drive Highway 24 to Huntington, what's it look like? It's flat. What's on the right-hand side as you're driving to Huntington? There's a ridge, right? There's a little ridge that goes up. And then if you look across the field, there's railroad tracks. What's past the railroad tracks across those fields? Another ridge. So that was the valley that formed when the torrent broke through the dam, Lake Maumee drained, and we had this massive movement of water across the state. I'm assuming it was a natural dam. Yeah, it was not a human made. There, <laughs> there were no people here. It would have been probably really fascinating to see, but yeah. there was no people here. Uh, well, not permanent settlements. So about 12 to, 12 to 11,000 years ago, we see ash, um, hornbeam, and beech forests are so now moving into from spruce fir into hardwoods. Um, and, and starting to look like forests that we might find elsewhere in Indiana now um, and uh, in, into Kentucky. And about 10 to 11,000 years ago, we get a transition to some hemlocks and um, birches and the oaks start to show up and the hickories start to show up. So things that we kind of are thinking about seeing in Indiana forests are starting to pop up. Yeah. Uh, well, spruces are pines, but not all pines are spruces. They're all in the same. So spruce, How can I tell the spruce and firs are also in the pine family with pine trees. Um, uh, firs are flat and friendly. Okay. So if you go shake hands with a fir, fir it's, okay. it's nice. Okay. So it has, has basically, it has a flat needle that's rounded. Okay. So they're not sharp and pointy. Okay. Um, spruces have really pointy um, um, needles that are roundish, they can roll them and you can roll them in your fingers. Uh, but both of those have single needles attachment, whereas then pines typically have two to five needles in a, in a attachment. They all produce cones though, they're all cone bearing trees. No, they're um, um, conifers, so they're not flowering trees. Monocots are flowers, flowering trees, and uh, or trees, um, and dicots are flowering trees. So maples are dicots, um, palms are monocots, um, spr spruces, firs, and, and pines, they're uh, conifers. Completely different group of plants. Evolutionarily, very different. Um, so about 10,000 years ago, that's when we start getting the first human settlements happening here. Um, and we have the establishment of, of, of humans utilizing the forests that exist in Indiana. Other big things, what's another big thing that happens in about 10,000 years ago? It's roughly 9 to 10,000 years ago, big event happens. Big event in, in human history and right. development. No, that would have happened earlier because these, these are the, the people that would have migrated through, would have come from that initial migration in. Development of agriculture happened about nine to 10,000 years ago. In North America, in South America, in Middle East, in Asia, all about the same time we have this development of, of agriculture as a, as a way to produce food. So nine to 7,000 years ago, we start seeing oaks becoming more and more common. Chestnuts become really common. Um, and so we would have had a lot of chestnut oak forests as well. And then about 6,000 years ago, we start seeing um, an increase in beech and maples on the wetter, more um, um, mesic sites, so the wetter sites. And then on the drier sites, we get a lot more oaks. And so we get this transition of forests as the glaciers recede, as climate changes, we start seeing a shift in what is the forest that exists in Indiana. And what we have now is going to be a mixture of this. 
We're going to have oak hickories, and we'll talk about this here in a second. We've got oak hickories. We've got beech maple for us. We've got some mixtures of other weird things um, along rivers and in swamps, especially in the southern part of the state. We get bald cypress. We get um, black gum forests. We get weird kind of wetland forests that form along the Ohio River that we don't see up here, um, but are really interesting. So now we know where the forests came from. Now we got to think about how they're kind of oriented and arranged within the state. Um, what we have up here is very different, like I said, than what we have in the southern half of the state. So we have a human, uh, humid continental temperate climate. This is why we have one reason why we have so much agriculture. It's because we've got tons of water. We've got really nice soils. Stuff grows really well here. So the forests that develop here grow really well. But unfortunately, that means it also does really well for row crop agriculture. And so we can cut down all the trees, plant rows of crops, and produce lots and lots of food. Um, but it's because of our climate. We have very moderate temperatures. We don't get too hot. Really, we don't get that cold. We don't get really dry. We don't get super wet. We have this very moderate precipitation. Um, things are, are shifting with precipitation, um, but uh, it's still pretty moderate. It still does well at growing plants. So if we look at the state, we've got riparian forests that along like the Wabash, um, and as we move down, um, that are mostly elm, ash, and cottonwoods. Plants that do well in an environmental range that has kind of saturated soils. And again, those forests have been impacted by us, but they still exist. Um, and I found, I found a weird one in um, New Haven. Um, some of my, uh, my field botany class, we do um, a service learning project, and, and basically they do plant surveys within different properties within the region. And so a few years ago, we, did, we used uh, Mosier Park in New Haven, um, which has a disc golf, and it's got ball fields and stuff like that. It's just a city park. But what we found was when we surveyed it, surveyed it, it looked like ash elm hackberry, which exists in the southern part of the state as ash elm sugarberry. And ash elm hackberry forests aren't very common up here. So it's not a rare forest. It's just an odd one. Um, and so it was really neat to find that and just kind of, it has a different kind of structure. It's got different trees dominating that um, then, then if you go across the river to what the university owns, which is mostly sugar maple, um, it's a very different kind of forest. So just kind of a neat place um, that probably didn't naturally form. It probably formed because there was a lot of railroad activity there and kind of changed the site a lot, and it became this odd forest. Um, again, it wanted to be a forest, and so it got to be a forest through time, but where it started was kind of a weird place because of, of railroad activity there. Um, again, southern part of the state, we're going to see black gum, cypress swamps, um, some wa water, uh, the kind of uh, the water-associated oaks. Very wet, so we'll have wetland um, forests in the southern part of the state that are, are different than we see up here. Um, oh, I skipped over riparian. What does it mean to be riparian? Yeah, along the river. So they become much more like linear forests. Instead of being polygons on a map, they become these lines along the river in the floodplain oftentimes. Um, then we see a lot of maple beech and birch, um, especially in the more lower areas where it's mesic. So when it's mesic, it means it's pretty balanced. It's got enough moisture for a lot of different plants, but it's not wetland. It's not too dry like we see in a xeric site. Um, and so with maple and beech, you're going to find those on sites that have adequate moisture for a lot of different plants. And then oak hickory when we move up. When we get up on a ridge top, it's drier, and that's xeric because it's, it's, it's more um, missing the water. And so we find oaks and hickories definitely up on the, the drier ridges. Be, with the exception of maybe that cypress wetland, like we could see 
the other three of those up here in oh, yeah. Woods. Yeah. not going down the state. No, 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 yeah. And I mean, so on this, this forest map is really, really coarse, but we've got um, oak and hickories, this kind of olive green right here, the lighter green along the rivers, that's the riparian. Um, this more strong, uh, vibrant green up here is the beech maple, which goes up into Michigan, but we also have oaks and hickories coming up here. Um, down here, these are those kind of cypress and, and uh, black gum forests are definitely down further south. Um, than anything we would see up here. Anytime you find bald cypress here, it's been planted. Even at some place like um, Chain of Lakes or at um, Little Wabash River Nature Preserve, which is an acres property, there's a lot of bald cypress there, but it's all planted. We're too far north for it to naturally grow here, but we're still within the environmental conditions that it can grow in we're just too far north for it to have moved here naturally. There's a lot on campus of bald cypress that's been planted. It does fine, it reproduces, it's just not gonna get here naturally without uh, us moving it. All right, it's been an hour. Do we need five minutes to stand up, get a drink, kind of take a break real quick? Okay, let's do it short, but let's definitely have a at least five minutes to just kind of stand up and, and take a break. Yeah. These chairs are like not great for your posture. They're comfy, but like I found myself just like hunched over them, you know? Oh, he's trying to put my back into the lumbar, but it's not going to happen. Yeah. The forest in Tennessee, is that the Albright room? It might be, yeah. I tried to Google it. Yeah. I get ready to come back and think about trees some more and forests in general. All right. So now we want to, I want to move on. Now we've talked about where the forests have come from and kind of some of the forests that exist in Indiana. Um, I want to start thinking about um, the parts of the forest. And we'll use Indiana as our example, but this is going to be applicable to basically any forest. We're going to have all these parts and pieces that are part of, of, of a forest. There it goes. So we have our biotic components, our living parts of the forest. First one, obviously, are the plants, because we've got trees. Trees are living and part of the forest. How do plants interact? What's that? So we have pollination, so that's going to be an interaction between individuals of the same species because that's all leading to reproduction. So maple trees will produce pollen that are going to pollinate other maple trees that are going to produce seeds and produce offspring. Their root system share resources? So there's some communication, some resource sharing. Depending on the species, there's stealing of resources. There's sharing of resources with others. Somebody said something else back. Yeah, so the roots are, that's where communication's happening. That's where um, some plants are stealing sugars from other plants. That's where, um, uh, yeah, so the, the roots are, we, we can never forget about what's happening below ground because that's as important, if not more important, than what happens above ground. So, is that a misconception? so there will be protection from some plants, but the protectors are not growing to protect. Mm -hmm. It's a byproduct of them just growing. Understand. Yeah. Um, and that, that happens, that really happens with um, when we have herbivores moving through. We can have um, issues with apparency. So if a if an herbivore can see the plant and see that it is food, it's going to eat it. But if the plant is hidden by another plant, then it may not get it eaten. So there's, there's an apparency um, relationship there. And so that, that is some of the protection that happens. Um, somebody, invasives. Invasives will get there, um, okay. but there's got to be more than just being invasive. What, what's going on with interactions? 
there's competition. So that, that kind of relates back to the roots because there's a lot of below ground competition. There's a lot of above ground competition. Competition is basically two individuals trying to use the same resource. So we have two trees growing near each other. They're trying to use the same resource, whether it's water, whether that's a molecule of nitrogen, um, whether that's a photon of light coming in, whatever. They're trying to use the same thing, and it's only can be taken by one of them. They can't t they can't share it. So competition is a is an important interaction. Yeah. Yeah. So if we're looking at plant level, no plants can, can convert, ni uh, can fix nitrogen. That's all bacteria. Um, but, and bacteria decompose and fungi decompose. So the plants themselves are, can interact and communicate through the roots with hormones and some other signaling communication, with some other signaling molecules. Um, so there are interactions there. Shade, shading yeah. out one another, that's competition. They're trying to use the light at the same time, and only so much light can be available for growth. Animals. We have carnivores, which are doing what? Uh, eating other animals. Herbivores. Eating plants. Detritivores. They're eating detritus, which is dead stuff. So animals are going to be part of that decomposition process by feeding on detritus. So dead plants, dead animals get fed on by other animals. Um, and that waste that they produce then starts to mix the nutrients back into the, um, the system. So what would be an example of a detritivore? Uh, there's a lot of beetles are detritivores. Vultures would be detritivores. Um, Bald eagles are mostly are much more detritivores than they are carnivores. Um, yeah, so all of the, the a lot of the invertebrates, so worms and beetles, um, are feeding on on detritus. There are some omnivores too, right? Yeah, so there there's going to be uh, individual animals that are mixing across that, that are taking up multiple different roles. But this was just kind of broad separation. So they're going to interact as carnivores with each other, but they're also going to be interacting as herbivores with the plants. Um, they're going to be interacting with the microorganisms as detritivores. So there's a whole, we're starting to build this really complex layering of interactions that is not just the trees, but everything else that's there. And then we have the microbes, bacteria, fungi in the soil that are doing the vast majority of the breaking down of, of dead stuff so that those nutrients can go back in the soil. And so none of that stuff can be created or destroyed. It's the conservation of matter. Everything that exists in terms of nutrients, in terms of water, exists, and it can't be created, it can't be destroyed, it can only be recycled. So the nitrogen that exists in a leaf has to enter the soil through decomposition from microbes to make that nitrogen available to the next plant. And so this recycling happens because of the bacteria and the fungi, which are then all interacting with the plants that are providing. So if we've got fungi that are colonizing the roots, the, the fungus is giving the plant phosphorus and water, and the plant's going to give the fungus sugars. So there's these interactions that exist in the soil that are really important to keep everything alive and growing within the forest. Did you just say it's going to give it the shivers? Sugars. Oh, okay. From photosynthesis. So the tree's making sugars. It's giving the fungus, it's giving the fungus sugar. Sorry. Uh, and the fungus is giving phosphorus and water to the tree. So multi-level interactions, very complex system. They just have overlapping environmental conditions that they grow in. So just like every single species has, an, has a range of conditions that they grow in with light, water, nutrients, and they just overlap enough that we start seeing patterns. So it's not that they 
they may not do anything together. They just happen to exist together because that's the conditions they want. Want. And then someone figured out that if you bump into one and grab the other and rub it on there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how strong that protection is, but that, yeah, I'm not. I don't. I don't test it on purpose either. But, um, uh, but yeah, there, there is that that possibility there that it's, and I mean, it's just you get oil on your skin. Possibly the jewelweed has enough water and abrasion to help remove it from your skin. All right. So that's all our uh, biotic, but we also have abiotic components of the forest. We have climate. So again, we're in that humid, continental, temperate climate. That's really great for growing plants. So our forests grow really well here, but also agriculture grows really well here. With a temperate climate, we see very uh, ex we see extensive plant growth. Plants like it here. The temperature ranges are great. The water uh, ranges are great. Um, decomposition rates are at a rate that regenerate the soil and give nutrients back to the forest. So stuff grows really well here. Um, if we move to a wetter climate, we start seeing greater diversity and abundance of plants. So the plants themselves are going to grow as it gets wetter, but we start seeing more different types of plants showing up. So if we move from here to North Carolina. So North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia make up this area of the US that is the most div plant diverse region of the country. Because it's slightly warmer, but not by much, but it's wetter. And so we see more different types of plants in that region of the Southeast than we do here. If we move towards Arizona, it's still in that temperate kind of zone, but it's drier. And so what we see is a lot lower abundance of plants, and the plants that grow there are going to be completely different because, again, those environmental conditions that a species wants to grow in, those boundaries, exist for a different group of species that can grow in that drier region. So the climate plays a real important role in defining what plants can get there and then what the forest can be in the future because it's defining all of those environmental conditions that control growth and survival of the plants. With every single or almost every single climate change model that exists now, so modern models, the Great Lakes region is getting wetter, especially in the winter and the spring. So we're going to see more and more rain happening through the winter into the spring as climate change continues. But we're more likely to see then late summer droughts. So we're going to see these time periods where uh, we are going to get super wet in this region because of the way climate changes, the way water is moving in the atmosphere following the energy changes. It's all about energy and the movement of energy within the, the atmosphere.